Today, they begin in chapter seven by doing a little bit of a reprise, a review of what we learned about the Fertile Crescent, in part because it is one of the most archaeologized places in the world. Outside of Europe, there's been a ton of archaeology that has been done on this area of the Fertile Crescent because they are looking for all these origins of farming, origins of agriculture, rise of the first states. So we know a lot about it. And the funny thing is, ah, the interesting thing is, is that the more we know, the more complicated it gets. And so it's one of those areas that the when we first started doing archaeology on it, it seemed pretty like a pretty simple story. You had farming arise, and then all of a sudden all these state societies arise as well. And now it looks a lot more complicated than it initially did. We now know that people, as they started to grow and domesticate various plants and animals, as they talked about at little niches, niches along the way of two different fertile crescents, one lowland, one upland, the people were still drawing upon a diverse range of wild resources in the area. And that as Graver Wengrow put it, that they were reluctant, I don't know if I want to use the word reluctant, but they do, reluctant first farmers in the sense that they weren't trying to completely base all of their livelihood on that. So they maintained a, a more uh, diverse environment. We talked about uh, things like flood retreat agriculture, which made it easier to do some of the tasks that would have, were associated with this, with the very difficult task of intensive farming. And they mention here that, again, in a parallel to what we talked about with flood retreat farming, a lot of the first land tenure systems were basically people holding land in common. That is to say, it had there was community over ownership over the land and they had open field principles so that your plots would be maybe rotate from different families or among each other, or you'd have uh, commonly held pasture lands. And this is true in many different parts of the world. And in many different parts of the world, this has been true for a long time. Uh, there are some people, as they mentioned, who talk about this as a tragedy of the commons, that people are always going to overgraze these systems. But in fact, we see that common held land arrangements are, are pretty common or well distributed throughout the world. Or as they put it on page 251, there is simply no reason to assume that the adoption of agriculture in more remote periods, a long time ago, also meant the inception of private land ownership, territoriality, or an irreversible departure from forager egalitarianism. Now, we've already seen that forager egalitarianism is not necessarily a thing and that the hunters and gatherers and fishers of the time had a variety of social arrangements. But what they're trying to emphasize here is that it just because you took up farming, it didn't mean you automatically had to put up fences and walls and make sure that your private property was privately owned and, uh, and that you would initiate a social hierarchy. So, um, and again, this is like we talked about with some of the first farming seems to have been done on the shifting soils of flood retreat, where it's very difficult to make a fence when the waters are just going to take out your fence or your boundary markers year after year. So this is what we know from the Fertile Crescent. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at some places where uh, agricultural arose outside of the Fertile Crescent in other places in other parts of the world. And what we used to think about this is that there were four to five core areas of domestication. So you had the Fertile Crescent, you had the Mesoamerican domestication of corn, you had the, uh, the South American domestication of potatoes and then rice in Asia, and that these were sort of the major areas of domestication that crops quickly diffused 
outward from these centers, and that these were also the places in which major population centers, cities, and states quickly arose. So this was, again, the standard story. We now know, this story has been almost completely revised, that there were at least 14 independent places where crops and stuff was domesticated, and maybe more like 15 to 20 places all across the world where people were domesticating various things. And so we now know that this is uh, at a couple different places in India, in West Africa, and in, uh, in what is now Papua New Guinea, which is uh, it definitely expands our vision of how people were domesticating things and shows us that there were lots of different ways to do agriculture in these parts of the world or in, in these various parts of the world. What is also true is that in none of these places did things go immediately from agriculture to population and a state. So we don't see this sort of, if anything, we see uh, in the first states arise, as they mentioned, after about 2,000 to 3,000 years of agriculture. So this is not something that happens immediately. And something else doesn't happen immediately as well, which is an old idea that we had, which Matt, you talked about the spread of farming. How do we often think about these things traveling around. Well, I guess I get it to the fact that, you know, we are the reason that certain crops and certain, like, cattle are in certain areas. But, you know, just, you just assume they migrated there or got there somehow. But, you know, they were in little lots of area and, uh, you know, we spread them around. I guess through, you know, sort of like a trading system. But. Yeah, I mean, with with farming, people have to do it. They have to be the ones. If you remember, wild, wild things migrate around because that's one of the things they like to do. They like to have their seeds dispersed or they like to travel around independently looking for better places. So wild varieties are migratory. But domesticated things like the wheat that we discussed uh, in the last class, becomes completely dependent on humans for its reproduction. So it's not going to move without humans. It has to, it has to be, has to have the conditions created for it by humans to help it spread. So this doesn't happen immediately. I thought their map of the, the independent centers of, of plant and animal domestication was good. It ma matched up with some other things that I've read, mainly from the work of Melinda Zeter's work on domestication. So we had a whole, actually a whole Eastern North America center of domestication. Uh, of course, Mesoamerica, very famous, and South America, also pretty famous. Um, but we also see uh, stuff happening in West Africa. There's the Fertile Crescent. We also see different places in India, famously in China, but there were different parts, also North Japan. And there's one we didn't know about in New Guinea, banana, yams, and taro. So we see these different centers and different things going on, but we don't see this overwhelming spread. We do see, or I mean, immediate spread. We see that in some areas, as they said, that people rejected farming. In fact, the farming did not spread. And so we read about before, uh, when we were talking about California and the northwest coast of North America, that they seem to have not wanted to plant corn or beans or squash, even though they had to have known that they were around. They were not far away and they planted other things like tobacco. So they knew how to do things. They knew how to, how to raise crops and they came into contact with people who had crops, but they seemed to have rejected it. 
And they say that in the southwest of North America, so what is now kind of the, the area of the Pueblos, that it seems like they went from extensive domesticated crops and farming to doing more and more hunters and hunting and gathering. And they speculate that maybe the Californian hunters and gatherers were spreading out already and introducing different ways of cultivate or different ways of living into the Southwest. So that by the time the Europeans arrived, the farmers of the Southwest were only a little tiny, tiny pockets, whereas the California method of hunting and gathering all those acorns and pine nuts and stuff that we talked about seem to be spreading around like Californians often do to this day, spreading out from California to try and take us over. So we see the, a very different picture than the idea that everybody, uh, everybody embraced farming immediately. And they're also in some ways speaking against a very famous hypothesis of Jared Diamond, which is that what Diamond was proposing is that farming spreads rapidly along latitudinal line so that it spread rapidly across from the Fertile Crescent all across Eurasia, but it spread slowly on longitudinal lines because the climates and the hours of sunlight are so different in the Americas or in Africa that it would have a slow spread there. And I think one of the obvious reasons why this does seem to be or I think they have a case for why this is incorrect, is that you see maize cultivation spreading from what is now Mexico up and reaching the northeast of the United States around 2,000, 2,500 years ago. And if it could spread like this, or maybe like this, there was no reason why it would not have been adopted in California if they didn't want it. So the idea that this was simply based on latitude and longitudinal lines, I mean, there's a certain truth to, of course, the fact that these climate zones are fairly similar all across the continent, but it does not seem to be the sole explanation of things. Graver and Wengrow say that one of the reasons we have the idea of this rapid spread of agriculture, rapid spread of farming, is actually based on what has happened in the last 500 years, where we saw Europeans spread out and basically do ecological imperialism from about 500 years ago. So when the Europeans came to the Americas, there was a, they brought different plants and animals and move different plants and animals around. We could also talk about the, um, the crops from the Americas like potatoes and corn that spread into Europe. Graver and Wengrow say that the Europeans tried to make things look like Europe, creating Neo-Europes. What place near here is like a Neo-Europe, do you think? A new Europe. Near here, yeah, if you went like, in fact, we are, we are actually kind of a Neo-Europe, but we weren't, we weren't the first one. Where are you from, Matt? Come on. Yeah, it doesn't count, but close too. <laughs> New England, the New England area. Hey, that's a good idea. That's a good guess. That was the first New Europe, and they had the brilliance. I don't know what we started calling it New England, I guess, probably quite a while ago. And it's true. If you drive through Massachusetts or something, and then you drive through England, you're like, hey, wait a second. I've seen this before. It kind of looks very similar. And then they came over here and cut down our, all of our trees as well and just kind of kept going to make it look like what was going on in Europe. Of course, as we know, this was based on the expulsion of the indigenous peoples or making them work or pushing them further west or just exterminate them, exterminating, trying to get rid of people and the spread of disease all the way 
lots and lots of diseases from the old world or the European Eurasian continent. And it seems like the, the depopulation of the Americas may be the first time that we can measure a global climate change that was caused by humans. Right, Liz, what do we call this? The first time that we can measure global climate change based on human behavior. The Anthropocene, yeah. So there's different ideas about when human activity take over. Some people aren't, aren't ready to let us out of the Holocene yet, but some people say the Anthropocene began in 1610, which is to say that's when you can see a, uh, a climate difference based on, again, the mass, uh, well, part of it is the mass, um, the mass dyings in the Americas, uh, the, um, and then the, the beginnings of the enslavement of African people in transoceanic voyages so that it creates a global shift in temperatures that we've been able to register. So a lot of us, when we think about ecological spread and the spread of different plants and animals, that's the model we have in our mind. And that's an interesting thing to think about. But what Graeber and Wengro say is that's not what things were like 10,000 years ago as farming started to spread uh, or started to be uh, started, started to start, began in different parts of the world. It, it was not linked to this kind of imperial apparatus. Now, at that point, they ask us a profound question which is, if people were so smart, how come it only, why didn't it start a long time before that? Yeah, why didn't we do it sooner if we're so smart? Huh? The Ice Age, it was too cold too cold to do it, freezing. So that's why you couldn't do agriculture until about 10,000 years ago. They said that there was one time that you could have done it. There's one other time in the last 200,000 years, which was called the Emian interglacial period about 130,000 years ago. Why couldn't we do it then? Why couldn't we start farming 130,000 years ago? During this little, long, there was a warming period. We had a chance, we had a good chance. Now the environment was good. You know, the problem with where the people were though. Where were all the people 130,000 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> huh? No, both wrong. Where were they? Where were Homo sapiens? At least, huh? No, oh, will you stop <laughs> saying caves and bushes? Give me a continent. Um, yes, we were the, all Homo sapiens oh. were basically in Africa. There were some others spread around, but you know they. They had their own things going on. So humans weren't ready to take advantage of the warming that happened then. Um, they were not in the Americas. They were not in uh, basically mostly in Africa. So that limits us to what we call the Holocene, the warming period, which gives humanity, Raven Wengro says, it gives us a, a blank slate and it becomes a golden age of... What kind of people enjoy warmer climates? Everybody, but who in particular? <laughs> Everybody. What kind of people? 
Uh, trick question. They actually say that although farming developed during the Golden Age, it was a or during the Holocene, it was a great time to be a hunter gatherer and especially a fisher because all of a sudden you got all these rivers, you can expand into the the marine area, and you can. It actually, in some ways, there was a bigger expansions of hunting and gathering and fishing than there was of farming, and so the farmers come in as they called them the cultural underdogs they're not the ones who are in control of the place and they're basically going into the places where nobody else wants to be so it's kind of the reverse of what has happened over the last 500 years where farmers take over and we push hunter gatherers into the worst spaces that nobody wants to be in the early days it was dominated by hunting and gathering and they had all the best land Whereas the farmers were coming into places where were relatively un, relatively not good for uh, for hunting and gathering, and so during this time, they take the title of this chapter from a book called "The Ecology of Freedom." What did they want to do during this time, Felicia? What did they What did they prefer to do? What the heck is an ecology of freedom? They relied on like other strategies to survive other than farming, mm -hmm. like hunting, barbecuing. Yeah, they combined all these things. What they say is that during this time, and maybe even today, most people like flexibility. Right? They can shift from various production methods, do some hunting here, some maybe some farming here, do some fishing, do some gathering, shifting around, stay free, not have to farm all the time. So that was the situation. They then turned to look at some of these some of these first first farmers that were spreading into the areas where there weren't wasn't so propitious for hunting and gathering. One of the first they look at are people who made pottery that look kind of like that. What do we want to call these people if their pots look like that? Hmm? No, what do we want to call people like that? Does that look very good art to you? Gabe, what do you think? Is that good art? Do you give that an A for your art class? Yeah. Yeah? Why? I don't know. <laughs> it's just art. <laughs> it's just art. Not all art gets A's, Gabe. Come on. Give that a C plus at best. I know. Oh, what is it? I could do that. I mean, I couldn't make the pottery, but I could do the art on it. Or is the pottery itself art? Is that what you're saying? Huh? What is it? What are those things? Yeah, but what's that design? What, what, when you do this, what is it? What do you? That's not geometry. They're just making lines. Anyway, I'm giving oh. you a hard time. These are called the linear. Because <laughs> what? It sounds like it's some big thing. I was. I looked these guys up. They, we called them the linear pottery culture. Basically, the people who drew lines on their pots. Right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> These people come into Europe at around 5,500 BC, and they spread into these areas of Central Europe. Basically, the like the yucky parts of Europe, the parts that nobody wants. The fishers and stuff are doing their thing in much more richer environments, so they spread into here. And they do all right for a while. What happens to these guys? Huh? They die. They end in... Yeah. 
mass graves, violence, and cannibalism. Yeah, it's pretty harsh, man. I mean, they do all right for a while, but you know, if you're just making lines on pots. Yeah, no, they they had it rough. I don't, I'm not sure what happened, but according to Graeber and Wengro, they tried this out and it was a complete failure, or at least they did it for a while. And that it took another, they took a pause on cereal farming for another thousand years before anybody tried it again. So, not the greatest. Dakars, there was some better, better, they did better in Africa, right? What did they do there? Herd cattle. Yeah, they basically, what they said is they took this, this sort of package from the Fertile Crescent and they said, eh, we don't want to grow all these crops, but we will start herding cattle on the large scale. So they have much more of a livestock herding focus. This happens in what is called the Nile Valley, which Graeber and Weingrow say is the ancient or the, the cultural roots of ancient Egypt. And this is somewhat important for us because there's been some debate about you know, the origins of Egyptian civilization. And in the next class, we'll talk more about what happens on this Nile River Delta and some of the cities and things that arose here. But the Nile begins way back pretty deep in Africa and this area is where a lot of the herding and stuff took place and was the first ways in which people were developing what people believe are the, the roots of what would be ancient Egypt or pretty firmly in Africa. Another place is what is known as the Lapita Horizon, which begins uh, probably somewhere around Indonesia and consists of taros, yams, and bananas, adding in a whole bunch of domesticated animals like chickens and dogs, and then spreading out across various islands the world's first deep ocean outrigger canoes. Pretty darn impressive, you have to say, to be able to sail off into the ocean and spread out into various islands and implant your society. So the known Lapita horizon could be pretty amazing enough just to see how they spread out to all of these islands. So this is kind of the archeological evidence for the first spread of the Lapita horizon. After that, and there's some debate about how far it went, but in terms of the languages, in terms of the Austronesian language, there's archeological evidence that that extends and linguistic evidence that that extends as far as uh, Madagascar in the west, out of course uh, to wait someplace you've been, Liz. I know from another class. <laughs> yeah, so they make it out to there and to what is known as Rapa Nui or Easter Island, which again, crazy, incredible ocean venture. Um, so again, this after the Lapita Horizon spread, but. In terms of the languages, some people speculate that these sailors made it on to the western coast of the Americas and brought back things like uh, sweet potatoes. Um, but that's still kind of hypothetical. So we don't, uh, it's a long trip. But it's, it's certainly true that they did go as far as that way. We have archaeological, genetic, all that kind of evidence. And yeah, maybe.
Maybe, but that's still pretty speculative. That's hypothetical. Don't quote me on that. We know the blue area, which is pretty amazing enough. Pretty crazy. So we'll give them that. This other part, whew, wow, that'd be that'd be good. Anyway, Graver Wingro says that the first three cases, so the the uh, linear linear pottery tradition, the um, the Nile Valley herding tradition, and the Lapita Horizon tradition were all very different, as you can see, in different parts of the world, different crops, different things. But they had three things in common. The three things were they were serious farmers. They were not just goofing around. They were very committed to those crops and those um, livestock. That was what they were dependent upon. And they they really uh, they, they were they were not as much into the, the wild resources or they would use them, but their their focus was farming. And in all three cases, they were going into the places where hunters and gatherers were not. That is to say, they were not intruding onto the main places where that were dominated by hunters and gatherers. In the case of Europe, as you saw, their expansion was not into the air, the maritime areas, which would have been uh, probably more hunting and gathering. In the case of the Lapita Horizon, they did not go into Australia, for example, which was dominated by hunting and gathering. Uh, and in Africa as well, they stayed along the, the Nile Valley. And so what they say is that in these cases, they also had, probably they were pretty much enclosed in their own society. They were bringing their own package of stuff with them. And that probably meant that they had a shared language in, in contrast to some other, other examples that we've seen about mobile hunting and gathering, uh, that they had pretty pretty rigid boundaries around their, their cultural system. So they then go into a place that was where they had agriculture, but it was a different place entirely, uh, which is in the Amazon. And in this place, you have a, they, they don't seem to be as, a, I don't want to say they're not as serious, but they had much more seasonal variation in terms of they do hunting and gathering sometimes, and then some, some farming. We saw an example of this when we talked about uh, the Nambiquara and their seasonal variation and what Levi Strauss was uh, talking about in terms of their alternating political systems. The other thing is in this area is that they say that there are no domesticated animals but a lot of them would capture little monkeys and stuff in the forest, and then they'd have them around as pets and travel with them. So there's kind of a strange, they're not really, or they, they don't actually even think of the, the animals that we would say as wild as hunting in the forest as, as wild. They are under the control of a spirit and they are themselves tamed in their, in their settlements. And so they seem to have a much more flexible approach where you're sort of enriching the soil through various methods, not all of which we know today. Today we know the Amazon as a place of, uh, of swidden or slash and burn agriculture, but this seems to be a different method of transforming the soil. And they also spread out, but they would spread out as if they were along a river and they would not necessarily colonize other peoples or colonize other areas, they would simply set up these sort of trading networks throughout the Amazon. So it's a very different, again, you have, you have domesticated crops and farming, but unlike the first three examples, this is one that seemed to be intermixed with other populations. This is a map from Davius on Wikipedia that shows the distribution of Arawak languages. And as you can see, it's all these little tiny centers along rivers. It doesn't spread in the same way as we saw in the other examples, um, kind of a lot of trading. And so they summarize here to say that, kind of like going back to the idea of the ecology of freedom, that a lot of the societies at this time would use agriculture and they might even intensify their agricultural production, 
but they still had a lot of the values of hunting and foraging. That's what they did a lot of. Um, and so again, that flexibility um, and able to move in and out of farming. And the other factor here is, as we saw, that some of the farmers, some of the early farmers failed, like those linear pottery culture people, maybe because their pottery was only C plus in my estimation. Now they failed because they became, I think the one of the reasons they failed for any graver wind growers, they they became too dependent on only a few varieties of plants and of plants and animals so that they reduced the number of uh, the number of things that they were cultivating this is actually on page uh, 272 where they they seem to be reliant on uh, a smaller number of things at the end of this chapter Graber and Wengrow do a good thing, I think, that I like to do sometimes, but here they did it for me. The why does it all matter section, starting on page 273. Why does it all matter? See, it's going to be an overview of the dangers of teleological reasoning. Of course, teleological is a big word. We heard this word before. Too big. Te teleology basically implies that you're on one track. There's my train tracks. That whatever is happening at the end of your journey has already been prefigured at the beginning. And there's and you're basically on the way to something and you're going to get there and it, the rest of it doesn't matter because you're on a one track system. Teleological reasoning. So they begin with a skeptic. And the skeptic, they say, would say, well, fine. OK, people did farming in all these different ways, blah, blah, blah. But. If you look at the long-term effects, if you look at what happens at the end, the end of our story, that farming eventually unlocks the carrying capacity of land so that you can support more people on land that more people than would have been supported under hunting and gathering. And so if you unlock that carrying capacity, then you can make your population big. You can make it as big as it is and at, in today and have these huge population centers. And if you have huge population centers, then you need people who will control them and lead them. And those people need to be fed by the farmers. So they need that agricultural surplus. And so this is the end of this story. And so the skeptic says to Graber and Wengrow, who cares what happens in the middle? This is what happens in the end. We know how we got there. So no big deal. They say that there is a danger to this. The danger is, the first of all, is that it just does not reflect history. And so it becomes, like other things we've been saying, just a so what story, a fairy tale, or a myth about history. It doesn't reflect the actual historical complexity of this. And that by doing so, if you just skip over the middle part, you lose all the things, the complexity and the possibility of what was going on and the ways in which history was not necessarily along this one track, but there were different things that were happening. Now, I'm not sure if they mentioned this, like I said, this is perhaps implicit in this danger, but for me, one of the biggest dangers of teleological reasoning is if you, dismiss the idea that there were different possibilities in the past, that history could have been different, then you're also foreclosing or cutting off the idea that the future could be different. And we've talked about this a little before. If you say that we need agriculture to survive and, the, and that agriculture brings us hierarchy, and the only way we're going to get rid of the problems of agriculture would be to go back to everyone being hunters and gatherers, nobody's gonna do that. 
it's not going to be possible and it's going to cut off your cut off, cut off your options so uh the dangers of teleological reasoning assuming what you know that is going to happen at the end and it was already given from the beginning are that you're you're basically cutting off these other realms of possibilities. At the end of the chapter, they also ask the question that is going to be the question for the next chapter, is that if you accumulate a number of people, if you have large, densely populated settlements, do you really need mayors and governors and police forces and bureaucracies to rule over them. And this has been assumed that once you scale up a society, you need to have these command structures. But of course, it's an open question. So that will be our question for the first part of chapter eight. Cities, imaginary cities. <laughs>